assistant systems and director Kepis Drafts. Please let me know if uh, the video quality or audio quality is not good. Uh, so I'll start with the introduction. Let G be a simple directed graph. Um, by that, what, we are, what I mean is there are no loops and in one direction there is at most one edge containing a pair of vertices. Uh, we label the vertices from 1 to n. Um, if there is a directed edge from i to j, then we say that uh, we denote that edge by uh, the ordered pair of vertices i, j. Next is the definition of adjacency matrix in a diagram. So suppose uh, the numbers a, i, j are defined as follows. It is 1 if there is an edge from i to j and it is 0 otherwise. The matrix a with its i, i, j entry as a, i, j is called the adjacency matrix of graph g. So suppose we have this graph uh, on three vertices, 1, 2, 3. Its adjacency matrix will be even here, is, uh, is what it is here. So there is an edge from 1 to 2 and 1 to 3. Therefore, these two entries are 1 and the diagonal is 0. Next, there is an edge from 2 to 3. Therefore, the 2 3 entry is 1. And as you can see, there is no edge coming from 3. So therefore, all the entries here are 0. Next is the Gaussian matrix. So uh, this definition is given by uh, child of whom in one paper which I'll show in the references. So according to whom uh, the Laplacian of G can be defined as follows. L is, uh, this die given means uh, I take the sum, row sum of the adjacency matrix and put each row sum as a diagonal entry of this matrix. And when we separate the adjacency matrix out of it, we get the Laplacian matrix. So for the same graph, we know the adjacency was this, 0, 1, 1. 0, 0, 1 and 0, 0, 0. So if I take the row sum of A, I'll get first row sum is 2, therefore there is a 2 there. Next row sum is 1 and the final row sum is 0. And the rest of the entries are just negative of the entries of adjacency matrix, therefore I have a minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 here and the other things are 0. So there are a few properties of the Laplacian matrix. Uh, what we can see from here is for sure L need not be a symmetric matrix. So this is written here. Second is all of diagonal entries of L are non-positive. Why? Because we are subtracting minus A from here and all the of diagonal entries of A are positive or say non-negative. So all of, of diagonal entries of L are non-positive. Next is the row sums of L are 0. The column sums need not be 0 and the rank need not be N minus 1. Why I am mentioning these two points is because these are naturally satisfied when we take undirected graphs. And here I am going to discuss resistance which was a concept originally uh, defined for undirected graphs. So there are these two properties of the Laplacian made things very easy to compute and uh, because of these very good properties of the resistance matrix came forward. So that is why I am focusing on these two. So these two are not generally true for any diagram, but uh, if we put some conditions on the diagram, they turn out to be true. What are those conditions? Are these. So first is a strongly connected diagram. What I mean by a strongly connected diagram is a diagram in which each pair of vertices is connected by a directed bar. So for example, I have this graph here and this graph here. So if we see the first graph, then I can see if there is a path from any vertex to any other vertex. Say 1 to 3, there is a path. By 1 to 2, 2 to 3. 3 to 1, there is a path. 3 to 4, 4 to 1. And so on. But if I look at this graph, then uh, there is no path from 3 to 3. Or even from 3, 3 to any other vertex. So this is not strongly connected. This is strongly connected. In literature, it has been already shown that uh, for a strongly connected graph D, the Laplacian, which is defined before, has rank n minus 1. So one of the things which we wanted is uh, rank should be n minus 1, that is sorted. The next thing we should look forward for is the column sums of L are 0. These will be taken care by balance diagrams. So for defining balance diagrams, first I need to define what is an in degree and what is an out degree of a vertex. So in degree of a vertex is the total number of edges coming into I. So if I have a vertex i, then all those edges like this, they contribute to the in degree and all those edges going out 
of the vertex i contribute to the outdegree. We say a vertex i is balanced in the graph if its end degree and out degree are one and the same. The diagram is balanced if all the vertices are balanced. So this is an example of a balanced diagram. As we can see, uh, the end degree and out degree of vertices 1, 3 and 4 are 1. One edge is coming in and one edge is going out. Same happens for 3 and 4. Next, end degree and out degree of vertex 2 is 3. There is this one edge. Uh, coming in, second edge coming in and third edge coming in. Similarly, there are three edges which are going out of two. And similarly, uh, the end degree and out degree of vertex 5 is uh, 2. So therefore, this diagram is a balanced diagram. Okay, so I am uh, writing the adjacency and the clash. You are muted. Yeah. Okay. Is my voice okay now? Yes, yes. Now it is. Okay, okay. Please uh, let me know if it goes in between. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah. So, the adjacency and the blushing of G are written as follows. Uh, so, why I am uh, writing explicitly the Laplacian here, just to show that here, see here, the row sums and the column sums are both zero. So, if I look at the first row, the row sum is zero and the column sum is zero. Why this is happening is because uh, every time here there will be a minus one whenever there is an edge going out of first vertex. And every time there will be a minus one in the first column whenever there is an edge coming into the first vertex. Because we know there are as, are as many vertices going in as there are vertices which are going out. Therefore, the row and column sums will be zero here. So, for a balanced diagraph, uh, in general, the column sums are zero. Um, so, the resistance in diagraphs is defined as follows. So, let J be the all ones matrix of order N. Then, the resistance between any two vertices I and J is defined to be uh, is obtained by uh, adding the ith diagonal entry and gth diagonal entry of the mode Penrose inverse of the Laplacian matrix and subtracting two times the ith entry of the mode Penrose inverse. If I take, uh, if I make a matrix R whose ith entry is Rij, then R is called the resistance matrix of G. So this resistance matrix is. Uh, Okay, so for this graph, uh, I'll just show what is the resistance matrix. For this graph, we have already seen the what is the Laplacian. Now, if I okay, sorry, yeah. So the mode penrose inverse can be computed using any software to be followed as follows. And using the mode penrose inverse, the resistance matrix can be easily written to be this matrix. Okay, so the properties of resistance matrix uh, are discussed in this paper by Balaji Bhagavad and Shivani. It appears in linear and multilinear algebra. So this is one of the results from that paper I am mentioning, uh, which says that the diagonal entry of the resistance matrix is zero. All the non-diagonal entries are non-negative. And the resistance between any two vertices satisfies the triangle inequality. There are other results also in this paper. Uh, about inverse formulas and uh, cofactor sums. But because I want to discuss the resistance in directed capital graphs, I am not going there right now. So I will start with the definition of resistance matrix. So for each pair of distinct vertices in the vertex set, let dij be the length of the shortest directed path from vertex i to vertex j. Let dii be 0. Then the matrix uh, D with Ijth entry as Dij is called the distance matrix of the diagram. Also, these numbers Dij are known as classical distance. Now, by numerical experiments, we noted that the resistance in a diagram, uh, in a strongly connected and balanced diagram, is always less than the classical distance. So, for example, if we consider this graph, its resistance matrix will turn out to be the following matrix and its distance matrix can easily be computed to be this. 
If you compare each entry, suppose this entry to this entry, we can see the resistance between this is R12. So R12 is less than D12. And the same happens with every other entry, whatever entry we compare. So, given a general strongly connected and balanced diagram, we do not have a proof for double inequality, but we do have a proof when G is a directed capacitor. So, I am going to uh, discuss about that in this talk. First, I will start with a few definitions. Uh, what is a directed cycle? A directed cycle is a directed version of a cycle graph with all edges being oriented in the same direction. So, all the edges are here are oriented in the same direction. This is a Example of a directed cycle graph on five vertices. Uh, next is directed capitalist graph. A directed capitalist graph is a strongly connected diagram in which each edge is contained in exactly one directed cycle. So if I have a directed graph in which if I choose any edge and it is going to be a part of exactly one directed cycle, then that diagram is called a directed capitalist graph. There is an equivalent definition which says a diagram is a directed capitalist graph if and only if any two directed cycles of G shear at most one common vertex. So these definitions are equivalent and it is very easy to see how. So suppose uh, I assume the first definition that uh, each edge is contained in exactly one directed cycle. And suppose the second one is not true. That means uh, there are two directed cycles which shares more than one common vertex. This will give us a common edge between those two cycles which contradicts this definition. So this way it is easy to see and the other way around also it is very easy to see how these definitions are equivalent. So why I am mentioning these two definitions here are they will be repeatedly used in the proof. So uh, this is an example of a directed capitalist graph. So as we can see uh, each edge is a part of exactly one directed cycle. Also, no two directed cycles share more than one common vertex. Um, from this graph, uh, we can see that uh, e, uh, the in degree and out degree of each vertex is equal by either a vertex is a part of a directed cycle, that's it, one directed cycle. In that uh, scenario, there is only one edge coming in, one edge going out, and the in degree and out degree will be one. For a vertex like this, what will happen each directed cycle is contributing a 1 to its in degree and out degree and therefore balancing it out. So therefore in degrees and out degrees are always equal in a directed capitalist graph and hence it is a balanced directed graph. Next definition is spanning tree rooted at a particular vertex. So suppose G is a diagram with vertex labeled from 1 to n and the Laplacian matrix L. A spanning tree T of G rooted at a vertex I is a connected subgraph T which covers all the vertices of the graph such that every vertex of T other than I has in degree 1. So I have this vertex I and I am going to construct a tree. So what the first point says that every vertex which is here in the tree has in degree 1. And the vertex I has in degree 0. So there will be no edge which is going into I. So there will be only outgoing edges of the pi and T has no directed cycles. So there we, can, we are not allowing any edge like this, which will make it a cycle. So this is a definition of a spanning tree rooted at a vertex, particular vertex. For example, uh, consider this graph H and I will try to construct uh, spanning tree rooted at vertex 1. So I started with the vertex 1. Now, but I have to keep in mind that all the vertices are covered and all the vertices have in degree 1. So, because 2 has only one vertex coming in, I have to take this edge. Sorry, one edge coming in, I have to take this edge to make it in degree 1. Same happens with 3, same happens with 4 and same happens with 5. Now, with 1, uh, the in degree has to be 0. So, that's why this edge can never be a part of the spanning tree. But option I do have here is either include this edge or not. So therefore, it is giving us two spanning trees. I have included uh, this edge here and I have not included the edge here. And because I have included this particular edge in this graph, I cannot include this edge because it will make the in degree of vertex 5 to be 2, which is not uh, what we want in a spanning tree. 
So therefore, uh, this is how we can construct a spanning tree out of a dyad rooted at a particular vertex. A few notations I would like to mention. So let delta one, delta two are non-empty subsets of the set one to n, and pi be a bijection from delta one to delta two. A pair of vertices i j in delta one is called an inversion if i is less than j, but the image of i under pi is greater than the image of j under pi. Uh, we denote uh, all the number of inversions in the map pi by n pi. Next is for a matrix A, uh, A square bracket delta one delta two will denote a sub matrix of A obtained by choosing rows from delta one and columns from delta two. <clears throat> Again, for a subset of the set one to n, uh, we define alpha delta to be sum of all the vertices or all the numbers in delta. <clears throat> this is the main theorem which helped to prove the result. It is known as all minor matrix tree theorem. Its statement says that if we have a diagram whose vertices are labeled from one to n, and its Laplacian matrix is L, suppose delta one and delta two are two subsets of the vertex set such that uh, their cardinality is same, then the determinant of the matrix of the sub matrix of Laplacian obtained by taking rows corresponding to delta one complement. And columns corresponding to delta two complement is minus one times alpha delta one plus alpha delta two um, sum over all the forest such that I will explain later what are the forest what is the property of the forest here minus one to the power number of inversions in pi. So I uh, have to define I have to tell what is f and what is pi here. So what is f here is f is a forest it is a spanning forest such that F contains exactly as many trees as there are number of elements, number of vertices in the sets delta one and delta two. Second point is each tree in F contains exactly one vertex in delta two and exactly one vertex in delta one. <clears throat> and the third point is each directed edge in F is directed away from the vertex in delta two of the tree containing the directed edge. So uh, this is uh, something which I should explain. So if I have a forest and I have trees T one, T two, T three under it, then first of all, uh, whatever vertices are here, each vertex should be uh, like this tree can contain exactly one vertex from delta one and exactly one from delta two. And the next thing which is uh, <clears throat> required here is every vertex, every edge in F. Is directed away from the vertex in delta two. So since this is a vertex in delta two, all the edges will be directed away from it, like this. So what this is making is the this is making T one to be rooted at a vertex of delta two. Uh, now the bijection is uh, pi is defined as follows. Each forest F defines a bijection such that from delta one to delta two. Uh, pi j is i if and only if i and j are in the same oriented tree of f. So this is a tree in f. We know uh, that each tree in f will contain exactly one vertex from delta two and one from delta. So uh, whenever i and j are in the tree and i is from delta one, j is from delta two, or the other way around, the images will be like this. Pi j is f. <coughs> So next, I will tell how matrix tree theorem is very immediate from the all minus matrix tree theorem. So let kappa g of i be the number of span trees of g rooted at i. Uh, if we um, substitute, if we substitute here delta one and delta two to be i, the singleton i, then what I have here is determinant of l. I complement I complement is minus one to the power I plus I, which is an even number. So therefore, this will be equal to one. Summation over all the forest such that uh, in times minus one to the power number of inversions in pi. Okay. So what is happening here is. Uh, once I have taken delta one and delta two to be single to I. We have the cardinality of delta one and delta two are equal to one. So therefore, f contains exactly one tree. So f is a tree. 
Now each tree in F contains exactly one vertex in delta two and exactly one vertex in delta. So because delta one and delta two are equal, there is only one vertex which can be there in the tree corresponding to these two sets. That is I. Also, we know each edge in the forest is directed away from the vertex of delta two. That means I is a root of this forest, which is a tree now, which is a spanning tree now. So what is happening here is we are taking summation over all the spanning trees of uh, G rooted at I. Now uh, this pi is defined as follows: pi J is I if uh, J is from delta two, I is from delta one. Because uh, delta one and delta two are same, what we have is pi I is I. So there is on, there is no inversion basically happening here. Therefore n pi is zero. So what we have is determinant of L, the sub matrix of L obtained by removing I a row. I a column is equal to number of spanning trees of G rooted at I. So therefore, we have this direct thing here, which is known as matrix tree theorem for directed graphs. Now, suppose G is a strongly connected and balanced directed graph. Let L be the Laplacian matrix of G. Because of strongly connectedness, we know rank is n minus one. Because of balancedness, we know rows and columns are zero. Combining these two properties, it is a uh, it is very easy to see that all the cofactors of L are equal, and therefore uh, this quantity, this number, this determinant does not depend on which row we are removing or which column we are removing. Therefore, uh, this number kappa g of i is independent of i, and hence we will denote it by kappa of g. Next are again a few notations. Let i, j, k be vertices in the graph. We follow the following notations. So first is this notation: uh, number of forest. Um, notation is like this. First bracket is i arrow and second is j arrow. What does this mean? Number of forest, spanning forest such that first f contains exactly two trees. Second, each tree in f either contains i or contains j. It cannot happen that there is a tree which contains both the vertices. Next is vertex i is the root of the tree containing it, and vertex j is the root of the tree containing it. Similarly, we define this notation, which is which is for number of forests such that which contains two trees, k is the root of one tree, j is the root of another tree, and the tree which contains j as its root has i in it. So using these notations uh, and all minus matrix tree theorem, we have the following proposition. And this proposition is for improving the main result. What it says is the determinant of the sub matrix of L obtained by removing i j f row and i j f column is equal to number of forest such that uh, number of forest f uh, such that f contains two trees. Such that i is the root of one tree and j is the root of another tree. Now substituting delta one and delta two to be i comma j in all minor matrix tree theorem, we have the following thing. So because delta one and delta two are i comma j, we have a two i plus two j here, and summation over f such that minus one to the power n pi. Following the all minor matrix tree theorem, I would Try to convert these three properties into what I want. So because now delta one and delta two contains only two vertices, it will be converted into f contains exactly two trees. Next thing will be converted into each tree in f contains exactly one vertex in delta two and exactly one vertex in delta. Now what is happening here is delta one is i comma j and delta two is also i comma j. So this will get converted into each tree in F contains either the vertex i or the vertex j, not both. And the next thing is each directed edge in F is directed away from the vertex in delta two, because delta one and delta two are both i comma j. So whenever i comma j occurs in any tree, every edge has to go away from it. This makes i and j to be the roots of the Particular trees in which they are occurring. So, using this, uh, I can write it directly that here the summation is over all those forests such that F contains exactly two trees. Each tree in F contains either the vertex i or j, and 
vertices i and j are the roots of the respective trees containing them so the next thing we have to see we have to count the number of inversions <clears throat> so uh, what i have is i have two trees one has i other has j as its root so what is happening here is uh, we know each tree contains exactly one vertex from delta 1 and one from delta 2 here that vertex is i itself in this tree so what we have is pi i is equal to i and similarly here i have pi j is equal to j so this gives us there are no inversions and therefore n pi is zero now substituting all these values back in this expression what we have this is simple one this quantity is also one because n pi is zero so what we have is a determinant of this this sub matrix is just number of the forest With these three properties, and we have already denoted any forest with these three properties by this expression. So, therefore, uh, the first thing is proof of this proposition. The second property is uh, if the vertex i is not equal to n and j is also not equal to n, then the determinant of the determinant of the sub matrix obtained by removing nth row, ith row, and nth Column J through sorry, uh, n a column J a column is minus one to the power i plus j number of forest such that it contains two trees, one has n its root and as its root and another has j as its root. And uh, the tree which contains j as its root contains the vertex i also. Again, it can be seen very easily from the all minor matrix theory theorem. But I have to do is uh, I have to put delta one to be n comma i and delta two to be n comma j. Substituting in the all minor matrix theory theorem, I have minus one to the power two n plus i plus j summation over forest f with some properties times minus one to the power n by. So first we will see what are those forests. So again uh, from mat all minor matrix theory theorem. Because uh, cardinality of delta one and delta two is two, F contains exactly two trees. Second is each tree in F uh, contains exactly one vertex from the first set and one vertex from the another set. So um, okay, so suppose uh, one possibility is uh, each uh, there are two trees, so the first tree will contain the vertex n. Then the only possibility. For it to contain a vertex from J, uh, okay, one second. Yeah. So I have these two trees, T one, T two. What I have to see is I have to arrange trees in such a manner that T one contains exactly one vertex from the first set and one from another set, and T two con contains the same. So if T one contains n, then T two cannot contain J. Sorry, T one cannot contain J in it. Why? Because that will make it happen that uh, T one contains two vertices from the second set, so therefore J cannot come here at all, and this leaves us to give T two the vertex i and J. This is the only possibility which can happen. So therefore, the second property gets converted into each tree in F exactly contains either n or both i and J. It cannot happen that one tree contains n and i, and the other contains j, or something like that. The next property says that uh, the vertices of the second set are the roots, so therefore n is the root, and here j is the root. So therefore n and j are the roots of the respective trees containing them. Next, we have to count the number of inversions. So as I have drawn the tree here, so this is the only possibility for the tree. Okay. um so what is happening here is because uh, the first tree contains only vertex n and n is a part of both the sets therefore pi n is i and and the second thing is pi i is j because j and i comes in the second tree so this is uh, giving us no inversion here also since i j is less than n okay so i have pi n uh, i have the vertex is n and j because j is always less than n What we have is uh, j is less than n, and pi j is i. 
which is again <clears throat> okay pg is i uh, i should write it properly please ij is i which is again less than n which is the image of n so what we are having here is there are no inversions therefore n pi is again zero <clears throat> sorry i don't understand that argument pi i is j is an inversion so it is not the the same inequality we following here j is no, no 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 i n is n so the whether for i j is an inversion or not depends on the relative ordering of i and j it has nothing to do with n right no, no, according no, to your no, i can prove it then i'll show you and i will show you i get the inversion is here so if i is less than j and their images are in the same right. so it only depends on the relative order of i and j yeah but the thing is Uh, here the i and j in question are n and j, not n uh, i. No 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 no. Pi n is n. N maps to n, right? Yes. Okay. So and pi is a permutation. So pi n is n and pi i is j. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have written. Yeah. So whether so that, n and i, not i and j. Because these two vertices are now in the what you say domain of pi. Ah ha. Ah. Okay. Pi is less than n, j is less than n. There is no inversion. I see. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So this since uh, there is no inversion again, uh, this quantity will reduce to. Minus one to the power i plus j number of forest with the following three properties, and any forest with these three properties we have denoted by this expression. I have one more part of this proposition which says determinant of the submatrix of L obtained by removing one and i th row and one and j th column is this number. The proof is very similar to the proof of B. That is why I am not discussing it here. Okay, so this is a lemma uh, which gives a very nice expression for the Moore-Penrose inverse of any matrix which is a Z matrix with row and column sum zero and rank n minus one. As it turns out that the Laplacian matrix in question here has these properties satisfied, therefore we can use this lemma there. Um, if uh, the matrix L is partitioned as follows: B minus B E and this. Any Z matrix with all these properties can be easily partitioned like this. Then uh, the Moore-Penrose inverse can be expressed in this form. To verify this lemma, it is very easy. Um, this lemma will be very useful in all the computations which will help in the proof. So uh, I'm not discussing the proof here. Okay. So suppose G is a strongly connected and balanced directed graph with Laplacian L and resistance R. Our first lemma is. Uh, If I have any two vertices i j such that either there is an edge from i to j or there is an edge from j to i, then the determinant of the sub matrix of L obtained by removing i th j th row and i th j th column is less than or equal to kappa of j. So <clears throat> by uh, how this happens is uh, why this is true is very easy to see from the proposition. So I'll go back to the first part of the proposition which says. That this determinant is number of forest, which contains two trees. One has i as root, and another has j as its root. Okay, so I'll try to yeah show it here. So this is nothing but this is counting number of all those forests which have i as root, j as root, and it's spanning the full graph. Okay, so any such forest here. Because we know there is an edge from I to J or J to I, so what what can happen here is I'll just connect this edge and I have a spanning tree, or the other way around. I can connect J to I and again I have a spanning tree. So therefore, uh, every forest here is giving us a spanning tree here, and that is why this inequality happens. Okay. Next thing is uh, we know if a graph is balanced, then the in degree and out degree are Equal, 
from now onwards i will call that degree as the common degree of the vertex side so whenever i say degree of i is 1 or 2 this means i am saying it's in degree and now degrees are the following uh, the next lemma says that uh, if we have an edge from i to j and neither i or j has degree 1 then the resistance between i and j is less than equal to 1 because there is an edge between i and j this number 1 is nothing but the classical distance between i and j so in a way for any vertex whose degree is 1 we are proving the resistance from that vertex to any other vertex satisfies the inequality which we want here the directed tethers graph does not have to come in picture this is true for any strongly connected and balanced directed graph so suppose uh, without loss of generality we can assume uh, i to be 1 and j to be n let d be the matrix obtained by removing uh, nth row and nth column from the matrix l then using the lemma which i uh, showed above there is an expression for the moore penrose inverse of l let c be the inverse of d matrix if i denote c by cij let x be the vector obtained by taking row sums of c and y be the vector obtained by taking column sums of c um Uh, we know that uh, L is a matrix whose all of diagonal entries here are non-negative, okay, and the diagonal entries are always positive. So uh, therefore, we can see the matrix obtained by removing uh, nth column and nth row, which is B, is a Z matrix. And there is a result on well-known result on Z matrices which says that if we take the inverse of the z matrix and it is a non negative matrix this we will use this observation this result so okay from the definition of the resistance we know r1n will be the uh, first diagonal entry of moore penrose inverse added to the nth diagonal entry of the moore penrose inverse minus two times the 1n entry of the moore penrose inverse we using this expression of a i'll try to write uh, each entry here this turns out to be these numbers it can be easily seen and after some rearrangement what i have here is r1 n is c11 minus 1 by n times y1 minus x1 y1 is the first column sum of c and x1 is the first row sum of c what i claim is uh, x1 is less than equal to y1 because if that happens then i will easily get this inequality If x1 is less than equal to y1, then I will have r1n is less than equal to c1. And I will show that later that uh, from this inequality that r1n is less than equal to c11, we can easily prove that this is less than equal to. Okay, I'll show that later. Now to prove that x1 is less than equal to y1, there are two cases which needs to be considered. One is degree of vertex one is one, or degree of vertex n is one. In the hypothesis of the lemma, we have assumed like either of the vertices have degree one, so that is why these two cases arises. I will discuss the proof for case one. Okay, so um, x one is the first row sum of C. So this is nothing but summation over C one k, where k varies from one to n minus one. C is a matrix of order n minus one. And similar thing happens with y one. Y one is nothing but summation over k. So same thing, one to n minus one, c k one. Because the c one one is common here, I'll just focus on the rest of the entries. That means uh, c j k where uh, sorry c one k where k varies from two to n minus one. So that is why I start with k in the set two three up to n minus one. I'll see what is c one k here. So C one K actually uh, C is the inverse of B. So therefore every entry in C is a minor of B. Which minor? Which uh, that is written here. So C one K is the determinant of the sub matrix of B obtained by removing the K at row first column divided by determinant of B and here this expression is taking care of the sign. Now B is nothing but a matrix obtained. From L by removing the nth row, 
and anethol. So after uh, merging these two things, what we have is this matrix is nothing but determinant of L sub matrix of L obtained by removing NFO, KFO, NFO. So the NF column, first column. Also, determinant of B is just determinant of the sub matrix of L obtained by removing NFO and NF column, and this sign is here. Now, uh, in from the second part of the proposition which I discussed, this number is giving us the number of forest which contains two trees. One has n its root and as its root, and another has one as its root. And k is a member of that forest which has of that tree which has one as its root. Also, this expression is nothing but kappa of g. This is a standard matrix tree theorem for directed trees or directed graphs. And this sign uh, is taken care by the expression we obtained from the proposition. It's very easy to see. So uh, I have an expression for C1K in terms of number of forests and number of spanning trees. Now uh, what we have is we know we have assumed that uh, degree of vertex one is one. So and also we know there is an edge from one to n. This is what we have assumed that there is an edge from i to j and we have assumed i to be one and j to be n. So the only edge coming out of 1 is n, is going to n. So therefore the possibility of constructing a tree which contains 1 as its root and k is also there somehow is not at all possible. Because every such forest will look like n is here in the first tree, 1 is here in the second tree, there will be edges coming outwards. But the only edge coming outward of 1 is the 1 going to n which we do not want, which this forest does not require. So this means this kind of forest does not exist at all. This means this quantity is zero. <clears throat> okay. So this is why this, it is not possible and that is why C1K is zero for all K. We have noted one thing that C is a non-negative matrix. So now if I try to write what is X1, I'll get only C11 will remain and because all the CK ones are non-negative numbers, we have the required inequality. That is X1 is less than or equal to Y1. Um, the next case is uh, degree of vertex N is 1. The proof is not very similar. Uh, it requires a lot of computations, but it is easy to see. It's just uh, normal minor matrix computations. Uh, I'm not discussing it here because it will become very boring. So it is it is uh, there in this paper by myself, Balaji sir and Gapal sir. Resistance, distance in directed characters graph. It appears in Electronic Journal of Linear Algebra. So, but uh, <clears throat> I have proved here, if I assume that x1 is less than equal to y1 is true for case 2 also, then I have obtained that r1n is less than equal to c11. So that is what I am writing here. r1n is less than equal to c11. Now C11 is the first entry, uh, one one entry of C and C is B inverse. So again using the same arguments that uh, C11 is a minor of B and again B is a submatrix of L, we will get that C11 is determinant of the submatrix of L obtained by removing first nth, first nth row and first nth column divided by kappa of G. We have already, uh, have already discussed this thing in lemma 2 which is here, that this kind of submatrix, if we take this kind of submatrix, then its determinant is less than or equal to kappa of G because uh, every forest here can be converted into a spanning tree. Therefore, if I divide kappa of G by the left hand side, uh, this quantity is less than or equal to 1. And therefore, we have that R1n is less than or equal to 1. For all the vertices, uh, 1 n such that 1n is an edge B and either 1 or n is degree 1. So the only thing which remains now to prove is uh, consider those edges in which at least one of the vertex has degree greater than 1. Uh, these are the few lemmas which are properties of directed characters graph which will help in proving the main result. First is uh, that there is a unique directed path between any two vertices of a directed characters graph. This is very easy to prove. It just requires uh, like 
to go by contradiction and every time you will get the contradiction on the definition of directed character graph which says that every edge is a part of exactly one directed set next is uh, if we label the vertices from 1 to n of the directed character graph g and i j is an edge in number and suppose both have degree greater than 1 then we can partition the vertex set into three disjoint sets and the uh, disjoint sets are i j simple next is b j i arrow what this set represents is all the vertices k such that there is a directed path from i to k which does not passes through j so j is not here and the similar definition follows for b i j that to all those vertices k such that there is a directed path from j to k that does not passes through the vertex i but i claim here is that uh, these are the three disjoint sets they can they include all the vertices of b it is also not very hard to prove uh, the proof is there in the paper so um, this is the intuition for uh, how the partition comes so ij one partition all the vertices from which uh, which are accessible through j without passing through i are here in this set and all the vertices which are accessible through i without passing through j are here there is no other vertex which is which remains it uh, it is very much clear from after seeing this picture this is what i feel okay so the main result uh, for a directed character graph the resistance is less than the classical distance now because we know resistance distance in diagrams which are strongly connected and balanced triangle inequality is there therefore it suffices to show that rij is less than equal to 1 whenever ij is an edge the rest is taken care by the triangle inequality so also in view of lemma 3 we have already shown if either of the vertices i or j has degree 1 then we have the result so therefore we assume both i and j have degree greater than 1 again without loss of generality we can assume uh, i to be 1 and j to be n from before we know r1 n can be written to be this expression and again as before i will focus on proving x1 is less than equal to y1 so that i will have r1 n is less than equal to c11 which is less than equal to 1 because as we discussed before f chorus can be converted into a spanning tree and therefore this quantity is always less than equal to so suppose uh, k uh, lies in the set 2 3 up to n minus 1 then we have already computed before that c1 k is number of forest containing two trees with n as a root other has one as a root and k as a member divided by r of g the same kind of expression we can get for ck1 also okay c1k are coming in x1 and ck1 are coming in y1 and that is why i am discussing these two so i want to have a similar kind of forest expression for the members of y1 therefore i am starting with ck1 so again ck1 is a minor of the matrix b obtained by removing first row and kth column this expression is taking care of the sign divided by determinant of b now b is the matrix obtained by l by removing nth row and nth column so we can express determinant of this matrix to be as determinant of a sub matrix of l obtained by removing nth row one nth row and nth column kth column determinant of b is again determinant Determinant of L obtained by removing n through n column, and the sign is there. Now, using the, the proposition which I discussed in the beginning, this expression, this expression here, uh, gives us the number of forests such that it contains two trees. One has n as roots, n as a root, another has k as a root, and one as a member. So, I have uh, similar expressions for C one k and C k one. So what I'll try to do now here is uh, I have uh, an expression in terms of forest for C one k and an expression in terms of forest for C k one. I will try to compare the number of forests here with the number of forests here to get the inequality x one is less than equal to one because uh, both the vertices i and j have uh, which are now one and n have degree greater than one. Due to a previous lemma, uh, we can partition the vertex set into these three sets. Okay, 
these are the following observations. Their proof is graph theoretic, and I'm not discussing it here because it's, it's not required that much. So what I'll prove is what I have proved is uh, okay. So we are discussing C one K where K lies in two to n minus one. So anyway, we do not have to focus on this set. We have to focus on these two sets. So what I will show is uh, if a vertex lies in this set, then the number of forests of this particular property is exactly equal to one. And this now this number of forests is a part of C one K. Okay. Another thing I have shown is if K is not a member of the vertex set, this uh, this that means K is a member of B one N L. Because the vertex set is partitioned into only three sets, so if something is not here, it will be here only. So what I have shown is here again. This is a quantity which occurs in C one K. It is zero whenever K is not in the set. And the next thing is whenever K is in the same set as here, then the expression which comes in C K one is always greater than equal to one. Using these three things, it is very easy to conclude what we want and how. It is very much visible now. So yeah, what I have shown uh, above is the number of forests, which was the numerator quantity in C one K, is exactly one whenever K is a part of this set. Otherwise, it is zero. Another thing in the observation which was shown is that C K one uh, has the numerator quantity to be greater than equal to one whenever K is the member of this first. Keeping these two in mind, and the thing that vertex set is partitioned in three sets. What we have here is x one is sum over from one to n minus one c one k. I have separated c one one here. So what I will be left with is c one one plus summation over the first set, which is b n one arrow, and summation over b one n arrow. We know if a vertex is not here. Then c one k is zero, so this quantity is zero, and hence we are left with only this summation. Now this summation is equal to uh, every entry in this summation is equal to one by kappa of g. Therefore, I have this third equation. Now from here, uh, I know one by kappa of g is less than equal to c k one for all k in the first set b and one n. So therefore, I have this expression that C one one plus summation over K in the first set C K one. Again, C is a non-negative matrix. Therefore, this expression is less than equal to the full sum of C K one from one to n minus one. This is nothing but y. And once we have x one is less than equal to y one, as I have explained before, it is easy to see R one n is less than equal to. This completes the proof of the main result. And this uh, this is the last thing in the talk also. These are the references. In the first paper, resistance matrices of balanced electric graphs are discussed, and the properties and the formula is explained here. Contains the proof I have discussed today: resistance, resistance in electric electric graphs. In the third paper, for the first time, uh, the Laplacian matrix, the exact definition of Laplacian matrix, which I have used now, was introduced. And Horn and Johnson contains several results results on Z matrices, which are used in the talk. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Sivani, for the interesting talk. Yeah, audience, if you have any question, can ask now. <coughs> so. Uh... Am I got a bit confused by your kappa of G? Your kappa of G was, uh, I thought uh, this was the number of spanning trees rooted at I. Directed spanning trees, right? Not undirected. Yes, directed. Then how is it independent of I? I got a bit confused. For undirected, it's okay. But why is it for directed? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the Laplacian matrix has these properties: rank is n minus one, and column sums are zero. 
So whenever we have a matrix with rank n minus one, rho and column sum zero, then all its cofactors are equal. Yeah. And kappa. Not all cofactors, right? Diagonal cofactors. No, sir. All. If no, but it could be off by a sign. I think all, all, not not sign. No, no, this is not true. I mean, you this is, see. I mean, even if you take, for example, undirected graphs. Mm -hmm. That satisfies this condition, right? Rank yeah. connected graph, rank is n minus one, and row and column sums are zero. Mm -hmm. If you take the off diagonal cofactor, then you will get a sign. It, it, it won't, I mean, in absolute value, I agree that. So I think that's what you mean. But if you take the IIF cofactor, then I agree that it's equal. But uh, so here you are seeing. Uh, so so here, yeah, this is why i is not important. Ah, so here you are using the fact that it's direct, uh, it's balanced. Otherwise, yes. it's not true, right? Yes. So if it's balanced, you say that, uh, right, okay, I see. So then uh, the number of uh, spanning trees rooted at i is independent of i. Yes. So I see. So, what is the main? Uh, where where are you mainly using this uh, cactus uh, graph in the construction of the inverse? Or, or where is? Okay, cactus graph. Exactly. The cactus graph you are asking. Huh. Okay. Uh, you had some result that was true for all balanced graphs. Yeah, that is there. That is an inverse. Okay. Uh, you are talking about this talk, right? Uh, the result which is true for all the balanced directed graphs is here. That if huh. we have an edge where at least one of the vertices has AB1, then the inequality is okay. This happening. Yeah. Where we are using the directed uh, cactus graph is here. Okay. So this property of directed cactus graph is there is a unique directed path from I to J. It is used in the main group where it is used first of all to have this kind of construction. Uh -huh. Here it is. So because, I see. So because every path is a part of a unique cycle, mm -hmm. there's a unique directed path from I to J. Yeah. That, that's where it is. Yeah. That is why this construction is there. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Thing is this. Another thing is I have shown these observations. So these require graph theoretical arguments, and here again the uh, uniqueness of path between any two vertices is used repeatedly. Uh huh. Okay. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ashwani, I have two questions. So yes, one is uh, related to Arvind question. Like uh, in this uh, cactus cactus graph, uh, you, uh, I think in the proof you are crucially using the. Uh, that between any two vertices, you have a unique directed path, right? Yes. So, any other property of this cactus you are, are, are you using? No, sir. Ah, okay. So, in case of... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In case of undirected graph, I think these type of graphs are called geodetic uh, graphs. Between any two vertices, if you have a unique shortest path, uh, in the undirected case, this class of graphs are called geodetic graphs. Geodetic. Uh, geodetic graphs. Maybe I can okay. uh, give you the details. Yeah, maybe you can mm -hmm. see whether if this is the only crucial property, then this ex this result can be extended for geodetic directed geodetic graphs. Okay, but the thing is for uh, directed geodetic. Ah, uh, directed okay. geodetic. Yeah, yeah. Between any two vertices, if you have a unique. Uh, okay, okay. So, yeah. uh, okay. What is the spelling of geodetic graphs? I would I will know now. <laughs> okay, G E O. Uh, D E D I C. I will mail you the details. Okay. 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 Yeah. So Geodetic so graphs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, information which I do not know about. Okay. And the main thing is why I am not able. We are not able to prove this result for any strongly connected and balanced directed graph is because of this property. Hmm. This property is used so that so uh, like importantly in the proof. That the proof does not hold if we do not have a unique directed path between any two vertices. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so one more thing is uh, you are using a property, uh, the inverse of a Z matrix is uh, non negative. Uh, yeah. I think uh, that result is in general need not be true. So we can see the simple example 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. So this is a Z matrix, <coughs> its inverse is itself. Uh, what did you say? What is the example? Uh, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. But the thing here, sir, is uh, uh, actually I missed some formation. Yes, yes. So I think the that matrix which was here, it was the matrix obtained by removing nf one nf column. Yes. Because of the Trashian and all the diagonals are permitted. Ah, okay. So you, yeah, yeah. So you are. So there are a few small things which I missed. So I know this result is not true for any z matrix. Mm -hmm. but the kind of z matrix which is occurring in the question here for that it is true yes yes you are right so here you are getting diagonal dominance maybe that's the property that diagonal dominance is yeah, yeah yeah so that, that is important. important that is very important yes yes yeah 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 that, these are my questions yeah okay, <coughs> yeah audience if you have any other question we can ask So one thing I want to say is uh, why I discussed this uh, particular paper today is because the problem, uh, the inequality to prove for any general directed balance graph is still open. open yeah. That is why I wanted to discuss this so that uh, if anyone wants to work on it, they will have some idea. Okay, if there is no other question, uh, uh, let us thank uh, Shivani for her uh, interesting talk. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shivani. Yeah. Uh,